is Rookery Waters the best venue currently in the UK? We're here today to find out. So we're at Rookery Waters today, which is at Pidley in Cambridgeshire. And it's one of those venues, whenever we go on the New Fish Anglers group on Facebook and mention about best venues, best breakfast, best tackle shops, this place is always mentioned. I've been here before, I've done filming projects here before, but I've never really fished the place. And Alex invited us along to come and do a bit of filming. So first things first, we're gonna go in the tackle shop because the tackle shop is amazing. It's one of those hidden gems of a tackle shop, tackle and baits. It's like an Aladdin's cave. In this era of racking and like really neat and tidy tackle shops, tackle and baits isn't that, but what it is is an Aladdin's cave, a rare treat in this modern era of tackle shops. So without further ado, let's get up them stairs and go check out Tackle and Baits. Well, I've been in this trade for 15 years now, and I still get a little bit excited about going into a proper tackle shop. And Tackle and Baits is upstairs, and I can't wait to get in there. It's a proper Aladdin's cave. Let's go have a look. Now, this is a tackle shop. Absolutely stocked to the gunnels. Morning. You all right? Yeah, good morning. Look at all this. Floats I'd never use. <laughs> Floats I would use. Right, we need to have a look around because I need to get some bait because I've turned up today and I haven't got the bait I need, so we need to get some bait, which is a good thing about having an awesome fishery shop like this. So let's have a quick look around because there's bound to be some gems in here that I want. And uh, we'll have a little look and get some bait. Pellets, pellets, pellets. This could be the secret for today, look. Bit of wheat. Not sure I'm gonna use wheat today. Literally everything you could ever need. Of course, there's a lot of uh, natural fishing around here with the, all the fenland waters, rivers, drains, etc. So, full range of uh, every natural type ground bait you could ever want in here. All the brands. So I've just spotted something, a lesser spotted JC Margin Pace. These have sold ridiculously well. Tackle and Pace have got four left, which is a result because not many shops have got them left. So if you want one, there's four here. I hate wafters as a bait. But I just saw these and I can't help myself. Look at them little micro jobbies. Let's have a little look in here. Look. look at them little beauties. Probably never going to use them, but I can't resist a little tub like that. Look at that. They look great. Feeder land. Nice. Uh, what do you reckon? Mid to far end of the crow then? Do for me. Thank you, sir. He's back again. What you've got? <laughs> More casters. More, More casters. <laughs> right. That's the exciting stuff. Well, some of the exciting stuff done. I think we'll get a bit of breakfast and then go do a bit of fishing. Right. That's my wallet emptied on the tackle front. Time to get some grub. Morning. You all right? Really important, dipping our nets. Now, it's summer. Diseases at all these venues are rife at the moment, so we've got to do what we can to protect our fish. So always dip your nets if you've got to, obviously. They're the rules. Dry them out. Dry them out at home as well. Don't forget, when you've been fishing, get your nets on your lawn, dry them out. Let the UV get to it. Let them kill all the nasty bugs and bacteria on your net. It's the least we can do. You've got these fisheries that put thousands and thousands of pounds into 
stocking and peg development and God knows what, the least we can do is dip our nets and dry them off at the end of the day. So let's get them done and then we'll get round to the lake and do a bit of fishing. We're gonna go on the Crow Lake. So we'll have a quick scoot round there, if I can get these out of the bag. I'll have a quick scoot round there and look. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. There's a bit of mixed fishing on Crow. A bit of rod work as well, which is nice. In here. So that's that job done. Let's get round there. Never fished the lake before, so it's going to be good to see what it's all about. Alex said, go on peg 21. This is peg 21. So I'm going to eat my sandwich. Have a little look. It looks great. This is Crow Lake. Looks very good. Nice, nice width as well to have a nice, nice little chuck on the method. So yeah, let's get this breakfast down us and then catch some fish. Can't wait. Actually quite excited about today's fishing. Love fishing a method and this just looks perfect. I think we need to get some Micros on soak is the first job, so let's get some water in my messy bag. There's got to be a bait tub in here, haven't there? That isn't full of mould and detritus. That one's pretty clean. Let's get some water. And I'll show you how we're going to soak the pellets because it's really easy. Really, really easy. The MIC method, Tupperware, some of my micros. Now, I normally like to do this before I get here, but I didn't have any micros at home. And it isn't actually fishery pellets at this venue, it's just use whatever you like, but I've got these from the fishery because I didn't have any. So I'm just gonna soak them in my Tupperware that's out of shape. But all I like to do for the method, just level fill them with water. Just like that. And then pop the lid on. And it's as simple as that. And then we'll come back to them. We'll get all, everything else set up. I'll, on my box and everything set up and they'll be perfect. But like I say, I like to do them the night before as a rule, but they'll be perfect anyway. And that is a nice foolproof way of doing them. Leave them there, they'll be fine when we uh, when we get fishing. I'm gonna knock up a bit of ground bait as well because I know everyone's pellet mad when it comes to the method these days, but I actually like ground bait. And I've been told that there's a lot of F1s, smaller carp, mixed size carp, but sort of two to five pound sort of carp. And for me, they're, they're ground bait and maggot fish. So I'm gonna knock up a bit of ground bait. So I'm gonna root in my van, see what I can find. Cause I'd be lying to say if I've uh, come fully prepared for this. But yeah, let's find, see what we can find. And then uh, we'll get some ground bait mixed up. People often overlook ground bait and it is fantastic. Um, very attractive, especially for smaller fish, which is what I think we're targeting today. So in there, I've got a pint of match method. Now I'd be happily just use match method straight, but in all honesty, I only had a pint left. So that's why we're having to uh, mix it up a bit. But fortunately, I have a bag of Thatchers with me and I love Thatchers for the method. So we're gonna put a pint of that in as well. Don't need loads of ground bait. When you're only using that, you know, small method feeder, you don't need loads. Obviously we've got pellets as well. So we're gonna probably use ground bait and pellets sort of 50-50, I'd say. So just mix that together. And then for the method feeder, I actually like my ground bait quite, it's damp, but it's crumbly. I don't like it over wet. The reason is you can't get the compression on the mold properly. When you overweight your ground bait, which is how I like to do it for the margins, for pole fishing, when you try and use that ground bait for the method, it sort of, you push it into the mold and it squidges through, it, like squidges out the side of the mold. Don't want that. We want it to press that feeder in and it compress. Something dead ship taught me and it's something that has stood me in good stead. So go careful with the water. This is. One of the rare occasions where I really take my care with my ground bait. Normally I just flood it, get it really wet. But for the method, I'm a bit more, a bit more picky about it. So little and often, which I, like I say, I never mix my ground bait like this. But for the method, I do actually like to take my time because I don't want it too wet to start with. And I will come back to this a few times to make sure it's right. See that, if it was at that consistency at the end, I'd be really happy with that because look, it makes a dense ball and that's what you want. 
So I'm just going to leave that for 10 minutes, get the rest of my kit sort of sorted, and then come back to it. And I'll just trickle a little bit in as we, as we sort of get set up. And then I'll show you the finished consistency when we're done. But that isn't, that is sort of what I'm looking for. So nice crumbly ground. That smells great. Nice colour. I think that'll work a treat. Nice little wafter or a dead maggot on there. Should work a treat. Get a lot of questions obviously about how long does elastic last and how a zip hybrid is very long lasting, providing you look after it. I always keep mine in a dark tube. I never um, leave my elastic stretched out between sessions because that just kills elastic. UV kills elastic. And if you're one of those guys who leaves your rigs on your top kit, your elastic isn't going to last as long. It's just a simple fact. Yes, it's convenient, but you're going to have to pay the price of that convenience with elastic that's going to perish a bit quicker because it's exposed to the light. So I always take my rigs off, leave them in the, in the uh, kit case. And another thing what I don't think enough people do is lubricate their elastics. Stands to reason that the smoother your elastic is, the less friction there's going to be on your uh, bushes, on your puller kits. So I always give every top kit a quick squirt of lube um, and then I, I like to keep the elastics wet throughout the session as well. So just a couple of things there that will help your elastics last longer. Keep them in the dark, use a lube every time you go and keep them wet in your session and they will last a lot longer. So the process I do, I just pick one up, is I just have my top kit in two pieces and I just spray down the number one and I just blow the, blow the lube down there. Like that. And it'll just come out the end like that. And we've got beautiful, smooth running white zip that retracts every time. It's fully coated, it's protected. What could be better than that? Okay, so we've got a bit of tackle out now. I've just got my rods out. Crow Lake here at Rookery. It's the newest lake on the complex. It's been here a couple of years now, but I've not actually fished this one. I've fished, I've, I say I've fished, I've filmed on other lakes before. Um, but yeah, this one's totally new to me. Now, it looks like the Glebe. It's the same sort of width as the Glebe. Um, same sort of dimensions, 25 pegs, pretty much in a line and a long straight lake. Um, but I quite like it because it gives you the option of a rod chuck. A lot of the lakes here are, are pole dominated. This one gives you a rod chuck. So, And that leads me to how we're going to approach it. Now, there's two clear and obvious places to fish. We've got the far bank, which I'm going to target with a feeder. And then we've got the margins, which again, at this time of year, I love fishing in the margins, particularly in the afternoon. But then we've got all this open water and I've got to think about what I'm going to do. I could fish a bomb three quarters. Alex did mention the bomb in the shop, but you can do too much sometimes. And I think that that is just one step too far, the bomb. I'd rather fish shallow on the pole. So I'm going to fish pellet shallow at sort of 13 meters. And then I'm going to fish, I've got the short pole option. Now I could fish pace short, of course I could, but I don't know whether it's a bagging water. I don't know whether I'm going to catch big fish, small fish. I'm not really sure. And I think pellets are a safer option than that short pole. So I'm going to fish six mil hard pellets short, paste in the edge, and I'm going to fish pellets shallow and then the method. And I think that that's a nice little approach. It'll get us off to a good, good start and then we can work out what we're going to do. So the first job is actually clipping up. Now, if you look across to that far bank, it's all, it all looks much of a muchness, but if you look a little bit deeper than that, there's two almost sheer clay cliffs over there. There's one in front of me and there's one to my left. And then the rest of the bank is pretty much like grass and reeds and stuff. Now I, I can assume that that flat clay is where the clay is actually collapsed in. So I think that that could be really shallow in that, that bay, which shallow water is good, but if it's like this deep, like six inches deep, then it might be too shallow for the fish to settle. So what I'm gonna do, the bit in between the two clay um, sort of bays, there's a bit of reason that, but it looks like the original natural bank to me. So I'm going to chuck there. I think that that looks a bit more of a, a safe bet to start with rather than going in those clay patches. It'd be so easy to just chuck in those clay patches because they're easy to cast to, but there's no point chucking in six inches of water when we're trying to catch carp. So let's just ping it over there. And what I mean is like, I'm going to chuck there to that little bit. And I can feel that there is a little bit of a drop there. It's still shallow. I reckon it's two foot or less, but it's certainly not. If I chuck into that clay, that sort of clay bay, as I call it. Watch what happens, look. And it is like stuck on the bottom and it actually, it's actually stuck in the clay. So I think where that bank's obviously collapsed in the wind, that's a very shallow area. So I'm gonna target that more natural bank. And I think that that is just a little point, but 
you can waste a lot of time chucking in the wrong spot. And I'd rather start in slightly deeper water and then work into the shallower stuff rather than going all guns blazing into the shallower water to start with. So that's the rod clipped up. Obviously clip up a little bit shorter and work your way across. I was very fortunate today. I just chucked it across by eye and it went perfect. But um, yeah, that's the setup. 30 gram bomb, nine foot feeder rod, six pound detection straight through. Jobs are good and let's get some pole gear out. Right, so we've got set up now. We've had a good plumb around and it's pretty standard stuff really. It's about 18 inches deep right in the margins, both sides. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how I plumbed at the margins when we come around to fishing it actually, because I've chosen a spot to my right over my shoulder. And now there's a very obvious spot to my right, but I've not actually, I'm actually ignoring it, but I'll talk you through that a bit closer when we come to edge fishing. Like I say, we've got the method up and then we've got the short pole and then we've got the long pole shallow. So let me just quickly run you through the rigs because we've got four rigs up and it's pretty standard stuff if, in all honesty. Um, I'm a very simple angler and my rigs sort of reflect that. So for the short pole, which is a top kit, short three and a, and a number five for those interested, a uh, number four, sorry. Um, it's pretty like a bit of a gradual slope. There's nothing too outlandish. It doesn't drop off any like too deep. And in fact, on the long pole, it's only about that much deeper. So this is um, pretty much at the bottom of the slope, if anything. And it's rock hard. You can tell this is a new lake. You put your plummet on and it's like, you can feel it like donking on the bottom. So I really like that. I think that's great sign. You're gonna catch loads of fish. Now I've gone for black zip. I don't know what I'm gonna be fishing for. So black zip should hook and land everything that I'm gonna to hook today. Um, I got 020 main line, and then I've got a 0.4 collet float. Like I said, I think I'm gonna be fishing for carp. And I like the two and a half mil bristle for carp. And I'm gonna be using six mil pellets on the short pole. That float does it nicely. Now it's flat calm at the minute, but as with all Fenland waters, it's very flat around here. This place I know for a fact can get really windy. So a float like this is a good option, something stable. These are wild waters, you know, you get loads of wind through here. A float like that is perfect. And then coming down to the shot, I'm not a big fan of like a bulk and droppers. I like to use like a, a spread bulk. It's something I've always done. And I've just got them a little bit further away than normal. If I was fishing up against an island, I have them about an inch apart. But because we're fishing in like five foot of depth today, I like to have them sort of three inches apart. And they're just number eights. Five number eights and a number 10 just to trim it up. Hook length is 014. And then I've got a 16 B911 and a band. Simple stuff. Now for the margin, like I say, I'm gonna go into more detail where I've plumbed this up when we come to margin fishing, because I think it's really important. Um, but the rig, I've got a nice, decent sized pole pot on the end. Green zip, again, I'd normally use the pink in the edge, but I say, I don't know whether I'm fishing for F1s, carp or whatever. So the green should be perfect. And then I've got 022 line. I've got four number eight back shot. I really like a lot of back shot when I'm edge fishing. And then I've got a point, point 0.4 Diablo float. This is a quick setting float, perfect for shallow water. I can watch it up against the, the bank, set it dead quick and it's perfect. And then I've got a bulk, five number eights. I might put a trimmer on that, but we'll, we'll see how it's fishing in a little bit, but five number eights. And then I've got a four inch hook length of 016 to a 14 B911. So pretty standard stuff. And then I've set up two shallow rigs. I haven't gone down the overshotting route again, like I keep mentioning, I don't know what I'm fishing for yet. So I've just set up two sort of multifunctional shallow rigs. They've both got the same float. They've both got four by 10 big head floats, just a lovely float for all around shallow fishing. Uh, the shallowest one is set at about 10 inches to start with. It's just got a bulk, four inch hook length. And then I've got above it, three number eight spread out. It's just something I like to do. And then about a foot of line above it. And then that one is pretty much the same, but a little bit deeper. And that just gives me two options for shallow fishing. So we spoke about the method feeder. That's what I'm gonna start on. Although I must admit it's gone very flat now. And in a match, if this was a match situation, I'd be thinking, actually, I might start shallow because it's very warm and muggy and it's gone flat. And that generally means that the fish are gonna come up, but we'll start on the method because I've got my new little wafters that I wanna try. <laughs> and, uh, and it'd be nice to catch a few fish on run the line. So let's get, a, let's get a barrier. I'm gonna start with ground bait and uh, let's hopefully catch a load of fish. Just a quick one before we do get started. I know you're itching to see the fishing. I'm itching to get fishing. Uh, the bait is really simple. I've got some those micros that I bought in the shop that I've put my Horlicks on, which I like to do. Just something that they'll be good for the method. They'll be good for going down the edge. 
very versatile option. Got to get micros with you. I've got that lovingly prepared ground bait. I've actually revisited that ground bait three or four times while I've been setting up, just trickling water in it and it's perfect now. It compacts into a nice ball, but it crumbles. And that's how I like it for the method. On the pellet front, we've got some six mils and then we've got some four mils. Now, I haven't got casters and I haven't got maggots. I said, I didn't really know what I was coming to do today. And I, I, don't, I still don't really know if it's carp or F1s or a bit of both. So pellets, you can't really go wrong. And I know people love using casters and maggots for, that, for shallow fishing, I do too. But four mil pellets still work really well. And especially when there's a mix of species, pellets are really good. So I've got four mil pellets of uh, shallow fishing, and then I've got six mil hard pellets for short. And then for the margins, a bit of a plot twist, I'm not gonna fish paste. Just sort of felt, I, I wanted to hedge my bets a little bit. I don't know whether it's a positive job or, a, again, I keep mentioning it, but I don't really know. So I'm actually gonna go down the ground bait and dead maggot route. So I've got my ground bait and then I've got some manky dead maggots. That's the best I can describe. They've been in and out of the freezer a few times and I actually think that that's not a bad thing. Sometimes when they're stinking horrible like that, I think they work really well. So they're gonna be the perfect bait for the edge. I could either pile them in neat or I could fish them with a bit of ground bait. And I think we're gonna catch loads of fish. But I'm gonna start on the method anyway with that ground bait around it. So without further ado, let's get it done. Lovely. Okay, so we've been fishing a few minutes now on the method. I've decided to start on the method. It's a safe bet. Could start on a short pole, but to be honest, when I was actually just getting ready just then, it went flat calm, and I don't like those conditions for short pole, if I'm honest. And I've got a funny feeling I might not even pick that rig up at all today, although the wind has come back on. Now, I've started um, casting really regular. And I've noticed something already. But the first thing, obviously we've got to try and build that shallow swim. Now, the reason I like four mils for shallow is you can be quite aggressive, almost like you're fishing casters, to be fair. And you can feed a lot more bait. And I think sometimes, whoa, <laughs> that's a good bite. I think sometimes having that option of feeding quite a lot of bait, it's really effective. Whereas if I was to do it with six mils, it's probably too much bait and too much noise. Whereas the four mils is almost replicating casters. But one thing I've noticed with this method straight away is there's a lot of fish over there. They're actually tailing up on the feeder and I've actually come off the bank a little bit and not gone as tight. Not a lot, like another eight inches back. I think it's probably just a touch deeper there. Now the first fish was a nice F1, but let's just see what this is. It's going well. Nine foot rods, lovely for this sort of fishing. I reckon it's probably just over 20 meters maybe. 25 meters perhaps. Oh, look at that. It's a big F1, that. Oh, no, it's a cat. Oh, cracking. Now we started off on the uh, little wafters I bought in the shop. And the, I tell you what, that's a great start. We've got that F1 first, first chuck. I'm just gonna show you how we're actually doing it. Bottom lip, lovely. Just gonna Cracking. Probably three or four pounds, I should say. Nice. And we've started off, as I mentioned, on ground bait. And I love ground bait in the summer. I think it's a great bait. Um, I think the fish love the activity of the ground bait. I love, they love the cloud, they love the smell in the water and everything like that. So we're fishing with ground bait to start with. Now, you just notice there's a bit of residue on my feeder and I like to get that off if I can help it. Obviously, the whole part of the method is you want to try and get it to the bottom intact. And if there's any old smeg on there, it can affect how good a seal you can make. Obviously, we need to be quite quick because I think the fishing is going to be good. Now, I'm double loading my feeder. I'm trying to, this early in the session, I'm just trying to get some bait going through the swim. So I'm putting one load of bait on and then I'm putting the second load in, the mould, putting my bait in there and then firmly pressing it down. And then before we give it a chuck, I just give it another decent squeeze and that's ready to go. Now, there's a lot of fish and actually, there's a lot of liners as well. Lovely. 
Now what I've decided to start doing, I, I'd like to actually hold the rod as opposed to putting it on the rest, but because I'm trying to build the shallow swim as well, I can't really do that. So sometimes when it's really fast and furious method feeder fishing, I find it more effective to actually hold the rod rather than put it on a rest. Um, it can mean that when you're getting liners and stuff, you can actually move with the liners, if that makes sense. But the one thing I've done to combat that is use a really light quiver tip. So that is a half ounce quiver tip that I've got in there. And that's for a reason. Every time I get a liner, it's more likely to be absorbed. Whereas if I was using a really a, a stiffer tip, I believe that every time a fish pulls against the line, it's more likely to move my feeder a little bit. Whereas that nice light tip just gives it a bit more cushion. It might purely be in my head, but I just feel like that makes a big difference. And obviously softens the rod, which when you're catching mixed sizes of fish, which I think we're gonna be doing, and it's obviously nice as well to have a nice soft rod. I've gone for a nine foot rod today, rather than my usual 10 that I normally use. I just feel like, again, the size of the fish, the fact that it's fast and furious feeder fishing, I think the nine foot matches up perfectly. And I've got to say, they've responded really quick. There's loads of fish over there and I'm not leaving it in long at all. Like I'm already thinking I should be reeling this in. But I don't think there's any like little fish problems or anything like that. I think it is carp and stuff over there. So I'll just fish this for a few, another 20 seconds or so. But there's loads of fish kicking about this feeding. They're definitely coming to the pellets shallow already because we're getting them bow waving through the bait. So no, I'll reel that in. And it's just all about sussing out where to cast to get an actual response, a quick bite, because there's loads of fish over there. And it might be that we have to come off the bank a meter or so because it looked great clipping the grass and I love, you know, trucking tight to the island. But if the water's too shallow and the fish aren't comfortable, you're casting for show rather than casting for dough because end of the day, we want to be coming back with a fish. So it may pay just the next chuck, come off the bank a little bit. It is calm. I can imagine when the wind's smacking into that bank, the tighter you get, the better. But maybe coming off the bank will, will pay. Or maybe I just need to cast more often because when the fishing's like this and they're coming, to, you can see them, look, they're on the bait already. When the fishing's like that, they're coming to the noise and I think sometimes being in and out really quickly is how you need to fish this kind of swim. But we're just working it out as we go. As soon as my line's sunk, we can start feeding the, the shallow swim. Like I said, I picked about 13 metres to feed that. Nice distance, and then we'll, we'll work, once we actually go shallow, we'll work out whether that's the right move or not. See, that was a quick bite again. And I just feel like this is the best way, the way I'm gonna get the most out of this method, Chuck, is to be in and out. Now, for those interested, I've got a, a 16 hook on, a little bayonet, six pound detection on the reel. Nice sort of balanced kit. Nice, as you see, the rod's nice and soft, which is what you want on these sort of venues. Bit of a lollopy one, this one, bit of a wallower. And I've just started on that little pink wafter, one of the round ones. I think they're only like four mil or five mil, which is a nice little, matches the feeder size quite nicely. But I am considering putting maggots on. I feel there's a lot of fish there and I feel like maggots might be better. They can be just brilliant. It's another carp. I'll tell you what, they're not little fish either. I was half expecting them to be three, like two pound carp, but they, I mean, that last one was three or four pound and that, this one's bigger still. Nice fish. <laughs> so I just assumed that with it being a newish lake, that there'd be tiny little fish, but judging by what we've caught already, that's not the case. Just see if we can pick him up to show you. I mean, look at that. Immaculate mirror. Let's pop him in. But already I'm, s I think that there's no place at all sitting on a cast here. This is fast. Oh, he's nicked me wafter. Can you believe it? Unbelievable. Did you not know I spent five quid on them? But I can see straight away that being in and out is going to pay off here because they're just 
as soon as that feeder goes in, they're on it. So we need to respond to that. And I think sometimes when the when it is like this, you need to be in and out because the bait's just simply gone. And last thing you want to be doing is sitting there fishing a straight feeder with no bait around it. So double skinning is working. I pretty much always double skin my method feeder. I like to put plenty of bait in. You may be wondering why I'm not just using a bigger feeder, but I think that this size is matching up with this kind of shallow water fishing nicely. And when you're in and out a lot, you get through too much bait with them bigger feeders. Nicely done. Even though it's quick fishing, I still like to make sure I do the basics right, mold my feeder right, sink my line, try and cast in the same place. Obviously that's easier said than done. But it'd be very tempting when I've got a shallow line to feed, a short line to feed, to not sink my line and just leave it on the top. But I just, I always find when you've got your tip bent right around and you're waiting for the line to sink, I don't know, it just never seems as effective as when you've got your line sunk properly. And I like to fish with a slack line, you see, or a slackish line. And I just don't think you can do that when your line's on the, on the surface. So it pays just to take those few seconds just to get your line under and make sure every cast is fishing properly. And then pick your catapult up and get feeding. And then you just got a little window before hopefully your next bite to get some feed in that shallow line. Look at this, this is fast and furious. Alex did say to me, you'll catch loads on a method. I didn't know what to expect, but this is looking awesome fishing. I bet you'd catch on a waggler over there as well. Oh, that'd be nice. You can't really knock this though, can you? Catching one every chuck in, pretty much. I haven't put any pellets in yet. Obviously the ground bait's working nice. Well, that's, I think I said in the uh, start of this video, we, I think people often forget, or forget to put ground bait on the method, which is crazy these days. Everyone's met hybrid feeder and pellet mad, but the method with ground bait is deadly, especially in shallow water like this. It's just a bit more positive, you're getting a bit more bait in and... Oh. All right. <laughs> I think the hybrids are, are definitely the, the feeder to use when you're like trap setting in the winter and spring when you're sitting on longer casts and waiting for fish. But I think when you're fishing in shallow water, being aggressive with a method is more effective. Another carp, this. Nice one. Oh, I'll tell you what, you'd have a wait. These kept coming. Not what I was expecting at all. Another mirror. I was, I had a couple of casts without a fish and I was thinking maybe I do need to switch to maggots, but actually, I think it was more like just getting the swim settled. And this is what I mean about the smeg on the feeder. Like if I was to put my bait on that, I'm not getting a proper contact to the feeder, which is obviously no good at all. So I just use a little bait and needle and I just, don't have to get it all off of course, but just get most of it off. And I even got my little bowl here and I can just help that and get the rest of it off. So get that in there. I mean, this fishing is just fantastic. And obviously rookery is an amazing water and it's just a great fishery. Obviously, you're always a bit apprehensive because you never know when you're going to somewhere new. Is it going to be as good as they say? Is it, are the fish going to be down the other end? But it looks like we're uh, on for a great day here. I can't wait to get shallow already. Okay, so we've had a great bit of fishing on the method. It's been brilliant. However, I just know I could be catching quicker. Obviously, you know, we're having a, just a sussing out kind of day, really, showing you a few different approaches, but obviously we still want to get the most from our swim. And I just feel like on a hot, muggy day like this, it just doesn't feel right what I'm doing. Like I'm catching, but I feel like I could be catching loads more. And there's, there's fish in my pellets. When I feed, I can see an odd one in the, in the bait. 
So I think it's time to go shallow. I've not even really, I've chucked an odd pellet in short, but to be honest, I've kind of, I'm kind of thinking that's not going to be the one today. I think it's a warm day. I think they're going to be in shallow water or feeding shallow. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to quickly whiz this in and we're going to have a look shallow. Now, before I do that, it's actually getting on now. It's one o'clock and I think it's, it's clear that this is a prolific lake. So I'm actually going to feed. I normally have a two o'clock rule when it comes to feeding margins, but I think we can probably fast forward that a bit. You know, this venue is obviously, well, this lake's obviously cracking and full of fish. So I think we can probably speed things up a little bit for the, for the sake of this. So I'm going to feed my edge. Now, what I'm going to do is use the same ground bait as what we're using on the method. But I'm going to actually wet it up now because obviously when I'm fishing with a method, I don't want it so dry. So I'm just going to get my bait in there and I'm going to wet it up quite considerably so it's really stodgy not quite slop but certainly over wet I think that's important when you're edge fishing you want it to go down to the bottom so we're getting two different approaches from the same mix now so this is <laughs> pretty much saying I'm not going back on the method but as you can see I've just over wetted that now nice and heavy you can actually feel the weight in that mix and that's going to be perfect and what I want to do I've got some dead pellets, uh, dead maggots here, dead pellets. We've got no dead pellets, have we? And what I'm going to do, I'm just going to put in a generous portion of dead maggots and cap the pot with the ground bait. And I'm just going to put one in. I don't like putting loads in. I know some anglers put in five or six pots of ground bait, but I don't do that. I like to put in one. I think that's very effective. And like I did mention earlier about where I'm going to fish in the edge, and it's there's this little flat. It's almost like a little dinner table. Uh, little dinner plate, sorry, and it's just here. I'm just going to accurately put that bait right on top of it and then go about my business with a shallow fishing, which is going to be lovely. So I think what we'll do, we'll start on the deeper rig, which is set at 18 inches there or thereabouts. And like I mentioned earlier, I've got those back shots above it. On these like calm days like this, I do think... Having a slightly longer line can work really well. Obviously, we can catch on overshotted rigs and stuff like that, but we're fishing normal rigs today. Now, interestingly, when it comes to the rig, this is a, a little 4 by 10 big head, and it takes four number 10 stots. Now, when I fish like this, I actually like to spread those four number 10s. So I've got two number 10s and two number 10s, rather than just having a bulk. I just think that it just makes it fall a little bit better, but it's still positive. I don't want it strung out and falling through. I just want it nicely balanced and I feel like that is a nice setup. Just got a four mil on, just one out of the feed. I have got some red ones as well. I do like a red pellet for fishing shallow. So I've got that option as well. But let's just try and uh, get one in the net first without before we start contemplating, uh, complicating the job. Maybe that we'd be better off with the orange zip. Looking at the feeder fish, they were all quality fish on the feeder, but maybe they're a slightly smaller, sam shallow. We'll, we'll suss that out when we uh, look at that. See, it, I don't, you probably didn't notice that there was a big fish, ignore that, but my actual float almost lifted up. So I think I'm fishing way too deep there at that. So I've got that other rig and we'll quickly whiz. We'll, in fact, well, let's do it. No time like the present. Fish are quite reactive to the sun and the heat and stuff. And I, I always feel like when it goes calm on these hot days, the fish often come up really quickly and change where they're sitting. So I've just got that one that's set 10 inches deep. Let's see if that's any better. Size 16 hook. It could be better. Just put the pole together, get a few sections out. And nice. Greet your pellets as best as you can. And we'll just turn it over and just see if we can catch one this time. There we go. That's what, see that, the rig change. Just, sometimes it makes all the difference, just changing that rig. You can be sat there getting liners or miss bites and just pick that different rig up. Yeah, that's one. Now I don't really know, obviously we caught a couple of those real nice mirrors on the on the feeder, but I don't know whether we're going to catch a few carp on this or if it's just going to be all F1s at the moment. Kind of why I didn't want to go down the uh, 
like overshotting route really because I don't think you catch as many carp when you do that. And so I'm just like I say, I'm just sticking to the uh, natural pellet for now. I've got like I say, I've got a few other options in terms of pellet colours and stuff, but I think my important is finding the depth where these fish are comfortable at. There's a million spiders on me. <laughs> Is just working out where that sweet spot is depth wise and then as just as, as we've all shallow fishing and I'm obviously trying to work out whether they want noise or they want a sneaking in approach and it seems to me like one slap is really good at the moment so we're really days into this shallow fishing session but we've hooked a few fish there and they've all come on the slap which is good I like it when you can that's a nice fish. Obviously the good thing about a slap is you're keeping your line tight. You turn that float over and, you, and everything's tight. So it just makes things a bit easier. It's a nice fish. Seems to me like they're like peas in a pod in here. They're like pound eight, pound 10 sort of size. Nice fish. But I've not had any carp shallow yet, which is interesting. Okay, so I was getting the I was just getting those indications, so I'm just going to take just a couple of inches off the depth, actually. And then let's see if that produces a cleaner response. Like I say, I love it when you just turn that rig over and you get a clean bite with no missed bites. Obviously, that's all a juggling act, trying to work out where the best depth is, but that's the key to this fishing. Still missed them. <laughs> what do I know, eh? They're there though. That is for sure. Just turn that over. And there's a, like a tipping point as well. Yeah, there we go. Uh, there's a tipping point. Sometimes you know you can come too shallow and you won't get any bites at all. I know it's stuff that we go over in most of these videos where we're shallow fishing, but it really is important that that depth that, you, that you're fishing at can just make your session. Oh, look at that. <laughs> that yeah, that depth you're fishing at is so important. It just can stop you missing bites. And I don't know what it is about when you come really shallow. You do often get these great big bruiser F1s as well, which is obviously nice to see. Yeah, lovely big fish like this. Obviously, uh, put a lot of weight in your net, but more importantly, a nice fish to catch. Look at that. They call him the Immaculate F1. He's a lovely fish. I'll show you him. Look at that beauty. They're the ones you want. Look at that. A lovely fish. Three pound, I'd say. And like I say, it's not not it's not uncommon that when you go a little bit shallower to catch slightly better stamp fish. I don't know what that is. I think they I don't know whether they're more aggressive than small fish or they just think they're a bit safer up there, out the way. Not too sure, but it's all good. I don't mind catching them either way. I've just seen my first fish down that edge, which is good news. So it won't be too long before we're catching down there. And if we can catch a few carp down there, it's, it's finished the session lovely as well. Ripples back on. A real changeable day. One minute it's windy, next minute it's flat, calm and hot. There we go. See that? No indication, just a, a nice clean bite. Absolutely fantastic fishing. I just love it. I love the shallow fishing. It's so such an enjoyable way to fish. So I was thinking that this elastic was a bit fierce, but actually, oh, look at that. <laughs> 
But actually, it's perfect. And I'm going to get on catch a load of these, actually. So I'm going to enjoy myself catching these. And then, next time you see me, we should be bagging up down the edge. Okay, so we had that fantastic bit of shallow fishing, but I started seeing some tails down the edge and once these little carp and the bigger carp get into the edge, I can't help myself and really fancy, nice big finish now down that margin. But before we get into actually fishing, I want to just show you, I mentioned about my plumbing up. I want to just show you a little bit more detail about what I meant by that. So let's just pop a plummet on now. This margin looks pretty typical as a, as a bay where someone's obviously cut it out. It's all trimmed back nicely. There was a big match of UK champs on here yesterday and obviously the, someone before me has trimmed it up nicely. But I think, crucially, I immediately my eye was drawn to that bay. But let me just pop a plummet on and show you why I didn't actually end up fishing there and why I've chosen to fish where I've actually chosen to fish. So in this little bay, it's very shallow. It's like eight to 10 inches deep. And it feels really lumpy to me. It's like a bit all over the place. Now I'm not saying you won't catch in there, but I just want to create a little sort of dinner, dinner plate sort of sized area. If I can find a little flat spot, I'm much happier. And for me, that where the flat spot is in that hole, for me is too shallow. It's about 10 inches. And I, you will catch carp up there, but I just feel like for F1s and stuff, it's a little bit too shallow. Could be wrong, but I, that's just my gut feeling. However, I put my plummet on and obviously had a good search around and then I found this little bit here and it, there's actually some fish that I bumped into with the plummet. And that's probably 18 inches off the bank. It's still relatively flat and then it's flat and it's flat and it's flat and then it's flat and then I'm up against something. And that's perfect for me. There's a flat, nice little area about a foot wide. It's up against something. Whereas I, to find the flat bit, in the little hole is two feet off the bank. Look, it's there, look, two foot off the bank. That means fish can get behind my float. That means fish can get at my rig from all angles. I'm gonna foul up fish there. Whereas I found a flat spot and I'm pretty tight to that bank. So the fish can't really get behind my float. And for me, that is a much better place to fish. It's a bit closer in, could be a consideration on some venues, but here I think that's gonna be perfect. So that's why I've chosen to fish there rather than the obvious, um, cut out nicely trimmed margin spot and it's all because I want to find that flat area to fish in and all I've been feeding it I fed it with before the shallow fishing one I put a pot full of ground bait in down there and a few dead maggots and then I've just got a really large sort of kinder style pot on and I'm just filling it up with over wet ground bait I'm putting about seven or eight maggots on the hook through the thin end and I'm just putting in like a a stodgy ball, I'm gonna call it. It's almost like a bit of paste, really, with a few dead maggots in there. And I'm trying to put everything in as accurate as I can. I'm trying to imagine that that heavy ground bait's gonna go down and it's just gonna stay as a ball as, for as long as I can get a bite, hopefully, or as long as it takes. So nice and accurate, turn that over, roll it in, and then lower that hook bait right over the top. And it's, that is how we're doing it. We're setting that little trap I'm up against something, like I said, so the fish can't, or minimizing how, the, how many fish can get behind my float. Hopefully, when one comes into my swim, I'm gonna catch it. There we go, just like that. And it, that is such an important lesson. Yes, you can catch them away from the bank, of course you can, but when it's that shallow water fishing, they are swines for getting behind your float. And I just felt like that, that was the, the better place to fish. And it's these little decisions that make you know, cut down your bite times and how long, how many fish you foul up in a session. Another F1 actually, but it all adds up to those, those little 1% add up. It's the same when you're fishing shallow and you're trying to get your depth just right, the same thing in the margins. And incidentally, it is exactly 18 inches deep down there, which again, for a mixture of F1s and carp is a nice depth. 
if I was just fishing for carp, I'd be happy to fish in sort of 15 or 12 inches, but because F1's are obviously a big part of the uh, the weights on this lake, based on what we've caught shallow, I need to consider that I want a depth where I can hopefully catch both. So just another, we caught a fish, so we might as well feed again. Got to imagine when you hook that fish, that little pile of bait has been dispersed. So we need to reset that little trap. Nice and accurate again. Get that out there and then lower that rig right on top. And this is why you have, a, have these heavy short floats. I'm using a Diablo in a 0.4, but I'd happily use the 0.5 as well for this. You just want stability. You want to be able to nail it up against that bank and then wait for a carp to come in. And that's the reason why we make these little short floats that take a lot of weight. It's for this sort of situation when you're fishing shallow water and you're trying to set a little trap. Now I haven't picked the big pot up. I've caught a few fish now down here. And I haven't picked the big pot up again. I'm quite happy at the moment just to keep feeding through that, that kinder style pot. But if nothing is coming in, then I will put more bait in with the big pot. So it's all about just reading what's going on. Sometimes it does actually need a big pot to get the fish in. But on other days it can drive them wild and you can't catch them. So you just got to, uh, just got, oh, there's one there, just past my bait. You just got to play it by ear. Like I say, there's no, if it turns, it's still quite early in the day for the edges. You know, it's just about two o'clock. And um, I, I'm not sure the carp are in there with like any force at the minute. In time, that could happen. There could be loads of carp in there, and I might have to go up into that shallow bay to catch them even quicker. But at the minute, I'm happy catching these F1s mixed with the carp. There's one there now. Important to be patient and sit over it, and obviously also read what's going on. It can be very tempting to just keep feeding, but sometimes you're just piling bait up on the bottom when you don't need to be. One thing I've said it in, in other videos as well is you can sit and sit and sit and wait and you, the bite may never come, but sometimes just picking your rig up and putting it back in can get you a bite. And I think sometimes the carp are grubbing around and they just miss your hook bait. And sometimes actually putting the rig back in, that hook bait must just flutter in front of them and it can sometimes catch their eye. So if you feel like you should have had a bite, you know, there's maybe been a fish or two about, don't, don't hesitate to just lift your rig out. It doesn't always work, but sometimes it just gets you a bite. We'll just try it. Like I say, sometimes the, the most attractive time is when your rig's just gone in. And I'm convinced that they sometimes just see it. See your hook bait come in. Like that. Oh, we've just got the green zip on. Nah, this is when we're, I love edge fishing, and this is when <laughs> you can start doing your big weights. And I don't think the, like I say, I don't think the carp are fully in yet, but these big F1s are certainly, uh, keeping me happy at the moment. And it may be, like I say, we might have to up the bait, put more bait in to, to, to bring more carp in. That might be what we need to do. But for now, we'll just take, take these nice F1s. A terrible bit of net in there. There we go. I mean, even them, they're, you know, getting on for two pound a go, great fish. And that little trick of just lifting the uh, the rig out and putting it back in, got us that one. So I'm going to crack on. We're going to see how we can work out the best way to catch them. It might be that I have to put more maggots in. It might be that I have to put a bigger pot on. It might be that I have to big pot. But we'll work that out. We'll do a bit of fishing and I'll report back to you in the final part of this video. We're having a load of fish down the edge and I just spent ages telling you about finding the perfect little dinner plate to fish on and all that business and ignoring that bay. But to be honest, I was catching loads of F1s and F1s are great, but I felt like there was carp to be had. And I just felt like that 18 inches might be too deep. Like it's just giving the F1s a bit more of a chance to get in and maybe the carp needed some shallow water. So I put the plummet back on 
and I've actually found myself a little flat spot in much shallower water and I've gone into about 14 inches of water now and this is the first fish I've hooked down there in that new shallower sort of area and it's a proper carp and this is again we're on about those little one percents and just finding that new area I wasn't quite happy with how it was going I felt it was a bit, a bit too deep I felt like I, be, I could be catching more and just making that tweak and we've, we've straight into a carp and that sometimes can be the difference especially on these venues where you've got f1s and car sometimes going in shallower water when the time's right of course you know we're getting it getting on in the day now and the fish are wanting to come into shallower water but the f1s are generally not as happy up there whereas carp will sneak up into that shallow water and going up there has got me this one first first try in and the difference is quite stark it went straight under i mean this feels really big <laughs> I've got green zip on which is, it's not oh I mean look at the size of that I mean it's not the heaviest last that we do obviously but it's a nice elastic and that is a great start and look at that that just shows you the difference between the just changing the depth and hopefully that is a start of a cracking little flurry of action down that in that shallow water so that's carp number one since we made that change and I'm not you know I don't mind admitting that maybe I got that one a bit wrong maybe that flat spot in that slightly deeper water isn't quite right but key is to actually make a, a point and change you know don't just think oh gotta do that because that's what we've said on the video we've got to change to make make the most of the situation and I felt like I wasn't catching the carp when there's obviously some in the swim so we found a new area to fish and I've not actually changed much. I'm still feeding that stodgy ground bait with a few dead maggots through it, like that. Because that stretched the old green out. Uh, but literally just started again. And fish are really re receptive to bait in the edge. And don't be frightened to move and, and start again. I do that a lot in my fishing. Like if I don't feel things are quite right, I don't wait for it to happen. I'll always change. I think that's really important to say because too many people are like, oh, I've plumbed up there. That's the only place I can fish. But, you know, there's low. The fish are very responsive in the margins and they will come to where the bait's going in. So I hope we don't be frightened to change. And I've just actually, from that last clip, I'm actually just past the that bay. It's sort of, there's a grassy bank. There's another cat there now. Shouldn't take too long to get another one. There's a grassy bank and I'm kind of just up against that. It's a bit of an undercut there, but it's nice and shallow and it is flat, so it's a nice little area to fish on. There we go. Look at that. I just potted that bait in and literally straight away. I'm interested to see if this is another carp or if it's a big, another big F1. A good fish anyway. And this is obviously where, when you get them responding to bait like this, this is when you can do your big damaging matches. And it's just been an awesome day. Like the fishing has been fantastic. You know, we've caught loads on the feeder. We've caught loads on the shallow. We haven't bothered on the short pole just simply because it's so mild and muggy. I just, I just can't see any fish being on the bottom really in this in this temperature. Oh, that's a lovely ghosty. I just can't see it. So I haven't bothered with that. It's set up just in case I needed it, but we haven't bothered with it. And then it's edge time now, and that's when I enjoy it the most when. Come on. He's like. Look at that. Another cracking ghost. Every bit of eight pound, that one. And looking like <laughs> there's obviously another one down there. I'll just show you him. It's dead quick. Nice fish. Cracking. And I think. We can probably sneak one more before it's home time because it is nearly home time, but I'm enjoying this. So while there's one more available, let's just nail him. So Rookery obviously is one of Cambridge's finest venues. And it's just, I can't, you know, praise it enough. It's got an excellent tackle shop. One of the best I've been in, to be fair. No matter what sort of fishing you do, you know, if you do 
commercial fishing, natural sort of water match fishing, you name it, they've got stuff in there like you wouldn't believe. They've got a cafe here, which is just fantastic. Everyone raves about the cafe. They've got accommodation. I've stayed in the accommodation when I've been on filming projects here before, and it's, you know, top drawer accommodation. You've got options there for camping and caravans as well. And you've got all these fantastic lakes that are full of fish as well. And it just, it's just a fishery. It's absolutely on fire at the moment. And judging by their plans, there's more to come as well. Can't say enough good things about it, really. You know, the lakes are full of fish. Fishing's great. There's loads of matches. There's everything you could want, really. Access is good, like today we're parked right behind our peg. It's just brilliant. There we go. Just setting that little trap, just working a treat. And I think that this one is probably the last fish of the day, cause I'm about out of bait, if I'm honest. I've run out of pellets. I'm about out of ground bait, apart from a few scabby dead maggots. I'm about out of what we've got, <laughs> what we started off with, but it's just been fantastic. Great fishing, and this, I think, is, yeah, another, another proper cart. So making that switch has really paid off and given us that big finale. That's a beautiful fish, that is. Absolutely cracking. So there we go. Final fish of this brilliant session here at Rookery. Is Rookery the best fishery in the country? Who am I to say? That's for you to decide. But you should definitely check it out. And we'll see you again. And we'll see you again on the next video.